point, like he came in here dancing. So don't be surprised. I mean, I did a little singing, he's gonna do a little dancing, and this is how we're gonna warm up our community. What can I say? All right, whatever it takes, you know? Right. And you're like sitting right in front of your picture, which is kind of poetic. Symmetrical. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, so we were chatting, and we thought that it would be um, nice to have an informal kind of more discussion. And so, because um, there's so much we could talk about, right? Yeah, it sounds good to me. I mean, symmetry is uh, it's a wild idea. It's kind of uh, present in our lives every day. So yeah, let's go in for it. In nature, in our faces, right? So we were going to start with you telling us a little bit about yourself, because you're, you're like born and bred Boston. Like, you're here. Right? Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, born and raised in Roxbury um, on Ruthvich Street, uh, which is uh, one of four streets on H Block in Boston, which is a pretty notorious part of town. Uh, on NPR today, uh, a cop got shot in my neighborhood. You know, that was sad. Um, and uh, you know, it was a uh, it was a wild place to grow up. You know, we uh, we we played on my block. It was a really I had wonderful friends, I had a great uh, uh, elementary school, but on the corner of my street, uh, they sold a lot of drugs. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of action around that, violence around that, and uh, as a young man, uh, I became very uh, gay-affected, is what I guess would be a good way to describe it, in that, you know, I had to fight a lot, a lot. And, um, you know, and, and so it's been a, a, a wild journey to, to stay on my path, towards success and using creativity to keep myself centered and focused on, on, on a practice that was able to, to you know, kind of relieve the trauma of, of growing up in that environment, but also uh, um, use those experiences as uh, a real way to enrich the art that I was able to produce. How did you get started on your path? Because, you know, I'm from Brooklyn and like, you know, the, the thought of, of arts and like funding goes down in schools and how did you first get introduced and how did you get started with art? So, so my dad was kind of a nerd. He was a he was a bookworm. You know, he, he met my mom in a, in a bookstore um, he was working at and uh, and and so uh, you know maybe three or four years ago I was at my mom's house for Thanksgiving and I went to open the living room door and I got a flashback of reaching up to grab the doorknob, pushing in, and my dad was in there teaching my brother how to draw. And my brother said, get out of here, this is my time to death. <laughs> my dad said, come on over. I was probably two or three years old, and um, I drew uh, Robin. My brother drew Batman, because he always, you know, he was that kind of guy. <laughs> so I drew Robin. And, uh, you know, but I never stopped drawing from there. It was always just a little something in, in class. I, I draw the pretty girls' names and transformers <laughs> and stuff like that. But I always, um, it always stuck with me. And then uh, there was graffiti all over the walls in my neighborhood, and it, was, it just captivated me. And so, um, you know, as soon as I could get a spray can in my hand, I was spray painting on walls. Great. <laughs> now we have that on video, so. <laughs> Although, you know, that led to something that was part of your path, though. So um, how, did, how do you go from that to Artists for Humanity? Well, that's, and so, so uh, you know, I, uh, at the Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School, where uh, I, I attended uh, for junior high, it was, uh, it was on Intervale Street. And Intervale uh, actually had a game uh, a resident gang. They hung out there. They would shoot guns and stuff. And uh, but we would. Um, we had a principal who was really. He was about unity. He was about education. He knew that me and my friends enjoyed our our Votech training in our school. I mean, you know, we, we were into we were in our the advanced work class and we were really into uh, you know history and math and everything. But sheet metal was by far my favorite class. And printmaking was also amazing. But they chopped all those programs out of school. They fired all the teachers. They locked all the classrooms. And to support us, our principal let us, you know, go out and spray paint in the auditorium and do stuff like that. 
And when Susan Rogerson, the executive director of Artists for Humanity, proposed an art project at my school, Stephen Leonard, our principal, uh, jumped at the chance and he put us in a room with Susan and she taught us like, she worked with us like no other adult had ever. She listened to our ideas, she, she implemented our ideas, and that was kind of, it was so refreshing, you know? I'm, I was a little nut in class, nutty in class, but they, um, and my teachers were always trying to get me to be quiet and sit down, but Susan was like, you know, she just saw that energy and, and put me to work, and, uh, and, and uh, we, we just formed a partnership and a team that's been uh, working hard, uh, making, try, doing our best to make Boston a better place ever since. That's amazing. You know, I was, because I'm a, you know, you Facebook stalk the speaker before, so you kind of troll and <laughs> learn as much as you can so you can dig up a, a little bit. Um, I watched one of the videos, and I think it was for your Kickstarter campaign, and there it features the kids, the artists that are in your program, and they say exactly that, actually, that they're listened to and their ideas are taken as seriously as if they were adults. And tell us a little bit about your mission and how that kind of all plays, plays in. Yeah, well, we're about providing employment and opportunities to young people uh, so that they can be self-sufficient and that they can find fulfillment and sustainability in their life through uh, creative endeavors and producing art for businesses. It's, um, it's a pretty amazing uh, structure. And the symmetry that, that, that lies there is that, you know, these young people are, are innovative, they're outside of the box thinkers, they're creative and energetic, they've got their finger on the pulse, you know, they, they've been raised in this, you know, technology focused social media landscape. And companies need that voice, they need that insight they need people who can navigate that space, and our young people are the best at it. And so, um, they're youth, and and they're uncorrupted, uh, but they're just so uh, so vibrant and, and and valuable to the to the business community. So, when you put them together in the same room, you end up with some really uh, uh, amazing uh, creative opportunities. Honestly, I was listening to the mission. I thought. All of us in this room could use it too, right? Like there should be an adult version of Artists for Humanity. Do you guys? We're working on it. <laughs> Come on down, you know. Awesome. Come hang out with us. Awesome. Yeah. So when you think about, because you are an artist, um, when you think about arts, artists, and humanity, how does that link together for you? If you were to kind of describe how that paradigm looks for you, what does that look like for you? So I, you know, yeah, it's our history is a wild ride of, of movements and, and new ideas and techniques but ultimately one day there was a guy he was freezing cold and he sparked a fire and he was nice and warm and so then you know the thing is is that in our world there are it's a it's a harsh world and there, there are rough edges and, and what the artist is here to do is to make it livable and beautiful and comfortable and and, and we create Things we fill voids, and 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 by doing so, you know, we're making this world a better place for each other. And and and, and maybe there's this one guy who's really good at catching fish, and maybe he'll trade a fish for a really nice bowl. Maybe you know, it's just there's this there's this there's this exchange um, between you know the artists and craftsmen and, and 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 the rest of the community, so that you know we have the things that will make this world. Uh, hospitable for us. And it sounds like you use artists as a very broad definition, like craftsmen fall under that, right? So in your, so at Creative Mornings, you believe everyone is creative and everyone is welcome, right? Would you ascribe to that type of definition for artists as well, for yourself? Well, yeah, so, you know, the young people in our organization, we're preparing for a career, and that career, you know, we want to see fine art, and we want to see painters, and we want to see sculptors, but you know, I'm very happy with uh, architects and interior designers and fashion designers and and, and uh, game designers, web design. <laughs> Just there's this all this design going on, and so you know, we want kids to be able to feel that uh, their ideas and, and 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 being able to solve problems uh, can help them uh, find a career in one of these creative fields where it's about making something new 
and, and different and innovative and, and groundbreaking and, and, and improving lives. Talk about how the art section of it, art, the art part of it rather, connects with the entrepreneurial part of it, the entrepreneurial skill development. Yes, yeah, so uh, when we're working with our, our teens, one of the very first things we had to do is help them get their ideas out of their head and onto paper. We all have great ideas. We all, you know, everybody's, you know, stubbed their toe and, and, and thought, well, I wish that wasn't there, or I wish there was a better solution for this, or, 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 or found themselves without the tools that they needed to, to get something done. Getting those ideas out, being able to share them with the team, mobilize that team into creating something uh, uh, beautiful or and useful is, is at the heart of it. And so, you know, when you think of art, it's about aesthetics, and it's not, maybe it isn't uh, as useful as a car or a wrench, but it does something important when it, when it makes your space more livable or entertains you or, or, or it sparks your imagination. And so we want our artists to be able to feel all of those things and feel empowered to make those types of things for people. So the art we make is a product. We put a price on it. We find clients that need it and, and, and want it. We find an environment where it's valuable. And from there, we're, produce, we're, we're building a, a business uh, that's sustainable, that, that brings in funds so that we can make more art. And I feel like everybody here is kind of taking mental notes, like, yeah, that's true. Because uh, hands, makers, hobbyists, creatives, artists, however you would define it, right? And then we struggle with that. And a lot of us have the, like, we sometimes, if we're, not as lucky, we have a very different day job and then we have kind of our side hustle, right? But I think these are all really cool things. If you could give a word of advice to the makers and the creatives, um, we're not adolescents um, and your program doesn't, you know, fuel us yet, it will, can't wait. Um, what would you tell us? Well, I guess, you know, when, as an artist, you know, art for me solved a lot of problems in my life. And when I'm faced with a problem, to me, it's, it, they all still f feel like art. You know, when we had to figure out how to evaluate our, our impact on our young people, that was just as artistic of a creative endeavor. It was something I had to create, it was a system. You know, when we had to figure out a way to track our clients or our, or the, or our projects, you know, it was still an opportunity to to implement a creative solution. And, you know, no, it didn't look pretty, but it felt good and it, and, it, and it moved intuitively and it was ergonomic and things like that. And so uh, I feel like though the, the skills and, and, and the creativity that you practice in a sketchbook or with a mound of clay, or with a paintbrush can still be implemented in Excel or PowerPoint or wherever you're, you're, you find your home. So uh, stay creative, uh, think outside the box, uh, you know, uh, ignore your detractors, uh, listen close to those that encourage you, and, and, and make things more beautiful. It's uh, an important part of life. Absolutely. How do you stay creative? Uh, Personally. So, so I don't know. I can't help it. It's impulsive with me. Like I just draw on everything. I will take my I will take all my handouts from my meetings and I'll fold them into origami and stuff. I you know, I draw on walls, like I can't wait to draw on this wall. I want to spray paint on stuff. I just I, you know, it's impulsive. I mean, you know, uh, I got a jean jacket. I found a jean jacket for fourteen dollars. It's getting painted on, you know. I just I can't help it. I really I and, and ultimately, you know, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to how to offshore stuff like, you know, big companies do. I want to have other people making stuff for me. I want to make a video game. That's my that's one of my, my new things. I like playing video games. I want to make video games. I just, I, to me, I don't see things that have been made and feel like they're made by someone else. I think we all can make stuff. It's, you know, somebody had the vision, so we can do it too. Nice, so you do manage. With all the stuff that you do, you still manage, that's awesome. I, I don't stop. 
Uh, nice. You know, I, I, it's, 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 it's every day. So you're in a meeting just like scribbling and folding. I bet your team is used to it. I, 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 yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you're like flying I, I, I sometimes <laughs> wonder if they think I'm just goofing off or ignoring them because I do some pretty amazing drawings in my meetings. But, uh, I, uh, but it's just how I, how I keep from fidgeting, you know? And, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an everyday process and I think we just gotta, you know, you got to feel the spark and you got to feel the worth of it, you know, you got to feel it's, it's a worthy practice. And, um, and I think when you do, uh, people can see that you have that kind of, that, that power. There's people who have that power, you can have it too. And, and when you see a problem, you can solve it and you can create it. Absolutely. So because I was trolling your Facebook, I'm going to open it up for questions in the audience because I think a lot of you have some itching questions. Um, you had a picture with President Obama. Can you tell me about that? I just, there was no caption, oh, and for me, I'm looking at it like, oh my gosh, I wish. Wow. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a, a crowning moment in my life. Uh, it was, so, they rented our space. You know, Artists for Humanity, we, you know, we have this amazing facility. Um, the epicenter is on 100 West 2nd Street, you know, if you guys want to. Uh, visit, uh, give me a call, come hang out. Uh, we have an open house at the last Wednesday of every month. It's next Wednesday uh, from 5 to 7. Come check it out. Share it on social so you guys all remember. Yeah, follow us at your page Boston. But uh, we, our building is unique in that we only had windows on the south and north side of the building, the east and west, are uh, just uh, stainless steel. So this gave uh, uh, the Secret Service a certain security advantage. <laughs> you don't build your building with that in mind. It was but that intentional. Was yeah. it, was, it was just, it was, it was just uh, serendipity. So then, you know, and then our loading dock was big enough that they could pull his car into it. These are their, this, this is their criteria. So they have this fundraising dinner. Um, Barack Obama shows up. He's, he's, he's there. He starts giving a speech. The reporters are there, they're writing everything down, they're recording his words, and he kicks the reporters out. And then he tells it like it really is. It was amazing. I swear, you guys do not know Barack Obama. He's, uh, he was so proud of his accomplishments. He was, he was doing so much for the country at the time. It was amazing. And so then, if you, pay, if you were a contributor, you could get a picture with Barack Obama. <laughs> and, uh, and so everybody who's all the contributors were lined up. I was not a contributor, but I didn't care. <laughs> there was a guy, there was a guy, a Secret Service guy, and uh, he had a suit, but he had something under his jacket. And I think it was a bunch of machine guns because he couldn't walk around. <laughs> but, uh, but he, um, but I, 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 I snuck in line. I, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. But, uh, <laughs> I buddied up to, to Barack and I just said, you know, I appreciate you, you know, you're, you've been an inspiration. I gave him a big hug and I got an amazing picture from my Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. We'd love to open it up. I'm sure you guys are burning with questions. I will walk around and give you a mic so you can, so we can hear your question. Anybody? Show of hands. Hello. I probably don't need, oh, maybe I do. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Gavin Smith, and I'm actually a high school principal, or working hello. towards it. Uh, so hearing you talk about how your principal created a space for you to uh, achieve what you are and inspire you uh, is inspiring to me. Uh, my question is, how do you motivate and inspire others based on your experiences, especially with working with adults and children? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I had a lot of teachers. I challenged my teachers, and but my favorite teachers were the ones that gave me a dynamic presentation. You know, I had a, I had a, a my English college professor. You know, quiet guy, but he would just giggle all through class. Just you know, <laughs> just having a great time, and you know, he always wore the same sweater every day. But you know, he was just he just had a. He was happy to be there, and I felt his energy, and it made me happy to be there. And so, when I'm with these teens, I make sure that you know I'm cracking jokes. You know, I, I you know, I, I compliment their, their, their jacket. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll ruffle their hair. 
but it's really, I'll ask him about the weekend, but it's really about uh, a relationship. It's about a dynamic presentation. Um, and you know, it's, it's why you know I love Sesame Street so much. I watched Sesame Street till I was like 15 years old. <laughs> I just liked it. It was just entertaining to me. And, uh, and so I, I want to make sure that the education that we're providing to these young people is fun, it's entertaining. I mean, you know, from the outside, I, I, I'll admit, I've been criticized. People think I'm just goofing off all the time. But it's strategic. I laugh through the pain. I don't care if I'm carrying boxes all day, all night. I still have jokes. I'll still do a dance. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'd rather be asleep. But it's, it's, it's always about just just having a little extra energy. It, it's, you're, you're the battery in the, in the back of that, that bunny. Right. Anybody else with a question? Uh, my name is Hillary. Um, I have a question about, uh, about your kind of upbringing and how you're able to overcome some challenges. What were some limiting beliefs or identities that you adopted growing up that might have helped you during that time, but when you kind of went into this entrepreneurial journey you had to shed or, or overcome? And what did that process look like? Yeah, well, so it's fun. I, I, and, and so, you know, I was having some issues with my relationships in my school and things. And, and at one point, I was just like, you know, what the hell is my problem? And I, I, I just started thinking, and, 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 and it kind of got, you know, this idea of trauma, this idea, well, so I guess, I guess it really happened. We had a, a participant come in, and they had, and they had suffered a traumatic experience. And I was just like, trauma? We're supposed to be, we're supposed to coddle this person, we're supposed to be gentle with this person because they suffered some trauma. Well, do you have any idea how much trauma I've been through? And I started counting off all the times that I had been jumped by multiple attackers, right? I got to five and I was like, God damn! <laughs> what the hell? Is, what kind of life is this? And so then I, you know, but then I had to stop it and, 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 and take pride in, in, in my fortitude and, 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 and really appreciate that, wait a minute, I've been through some trauma. Who knew? I didn't. I was just trying to, I just thought I was a tough guy. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I can, I can deal with whatever. But the reality was is that it was taking a toll on me. And it wasn't until I took a, took a moment to stop and, and reflect and come to terms with my experience that I was able to really move forward and, 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 and understand that, you know, it's, I shouldn't have had to go through what I went through. Um, I should make change in my neighborhood and make sure that other kids don't have to deal with this crap. And if kids are dealing with it, that they are, are, are that they are giving space and that, that it's addressed and that they're respected and that as caretakers, as, as educators, as mentors, that we're doing our best to build them up with an understanding of their experience. Hi, I'm, I'm Julia. Um, and I grew up in Boston also. I was a Cloud Foundation teen visual art curator slash Urbana project kid. So all my favorite friends in high school were uh, artists for humanity kids, and they were all much cooler than I was. <laughs> yeah. Very professional and um, I don't know, kind of edgy and interesting. And anyways, I so I've admired your work for a really long time. And I guess what I'm wondering is the kind of youth workforce development scene and, and arts education scene in Boston is just, it's so crucial. Um, your work is so crucial, raw artwork is crucial, Zoomix, you know, Urbano. And I'm wondering, like, I know that funding for, for your kind of funding and foundations in that scene has really changed in Boston over the past five, 10 years. And I'm wondering, like, what can a room of creatives like us do to support your work being successful at Artists for Humanity and just kind of generally in this um, community. Wow, and so it has changed tremendously and you know, it, it's, it's funny when we get a grant from a foundation, you know, there is this real, you wanna feel, oh wow, this is, this is just a group of good people that wanna do good stuff. And, but in reality, a lot of them just don't wanna pay taxes. You know, and that's, and that's the thing, you know. Um, we're providing a service for them. So to understand that, you know, the work that we're doing in benefit of, of you know, those, that 1% of, of people that can, that can really make a, a donation like that, 
um, is important, but it's also important for us um, to, as we move into positions in corporate America or uh, in the city um, that we're working to hire and patronize organizations like Artists for Humanity, um, the only way that we've been able to be successful is that we have this, this earned revenue stream. Um, you know, we're, we're operating 60% on donations like, a, like your average nonprofit, but there's another 40% of our revenue comes from the direct sale of the arts and creative services of our young people. And that's given us tremendous stability over the years, given us some, some workable funds, but it's also been extremely important to our program in the fact that our young people feel as though they're contributing, they see their artwork out in the world, they, they feel powerful that they can make things in art, but uh, and so that so it's important. So one thing all you got all you guys can do in whatever whatever companies you end up in, demand that there's artwork on the walls. If you you know if you're living in a city like like Boston, you know don't accept these hard stone square exteriors. You know demand murals and art and public art, ground level art for everyone. Um, it's important and 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 then you know appreciate the, the work that's coming from up and coming and new artists. You know, we need patrons, we need people to care about what we're doing. Um, and appreciate that it's, that it's coming from uh, a place where, you know, these young people had to work hard and break down some barriers to be able to make this art. It didn't come easy to them. And, and the enrichment that organizations like Artists for Humanity are able to give these kids is invaluable and it makes a tremendous difference. So, you know, just, just remembering that there are, that there's a place like this you can get your art uh, is, is important and will support us in the future. Awesome. We'll take one last question. Thank you. Jason Levin, just your energy and your wisdom. You said, uh, ignore your detractors and listen close to the people who encourage you, and that really resonated with me. How do you help people, especially young people, but like, what would you say to someone who's just at the start and they like, might not have as much natural enthusiasm as you, but you can see they have a spark. And you also see how fragile they are if someone not even detracts them, but just doesn't notice it enough. Like, how do you help people at that beginning moment? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. I mean, especially art, you know, it's like, there are all these rules, but you're supposed to break all the rules. <laughs> it's just ambiguous. And so, and you know, who gets famous and who doesn't? It doesn't make any sense. And so I guess, you know, I think the key is to just keep building your network, keep building your community, keep showing your artwork, keep making stuff, you know, find a practice, make it a discipline, do it for yourself, do what makes you happy. Right now, my art has been all about just trying to get to the place where I can just do what comes natural and people will appreciate it. You know, and it's, it's not, it's a hard place to get to. I feel like if I ever reach that place, that's then I'll be fulfilled and I'll be happy. But I'm not going to reach that place because it's you know there's always going to be a need to make something new and happen, and, and the world is constantly changing. So you know, I just I guess to to the to the new artist, to the new maker, to the new to the person new to this this community change environment, just I think you got to. Find a place in yourself that keeps you motivated and keeps you going, and um, and then in, and, and just go for it. I I think you'll be fulfilled in the long run. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, it, it's 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 a it's a tough game to play. I gotta say. I mean, you know, but I I do feel that the, that it's all in your mind, it's all in your head, it's all in your heart, and some of us are happy, um, and some of us aren't. But I, somehow. I'm happy with this struggle. I'm happy fighting this fight. I'm happy working with these kids. I'm happy trying to chisel this beautiful sculpture out of this hunk of stone. It's just, that brings me joy. And, uh, and I think, you know, those accomplishments that, that happen along the way, celebrate as much as you can, and, and you'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to keep going to an awesome place. Thank you. What a wonderful way to end um, our talk. Such a high note. Thank you.